One more time, that's uh, my total error right there. You missed a fantastic conversation we just had with um, here with Justin Owen from the uh, McDonald's in Orange Conservancy. Yeah. Yep, and Justin's a new, well, not new, it's a year and a year and a half. Yeah, semi new. Yeah, well, <laughs> semi new executive director. And we're out here at the at the preserve right now. Um, again, we just went through this and talked about it, and I screwed up and didn't record it correctly, so that's my fault. But we're back and we're going to do it again. Uh, tell us a little bit about your day to day. So, I mean, you're managing hundreds of volunteers, mm -hmm. your staff, you're working with the city. Um, that's kind of got to be going all the time, huh? Oh yeah, pretty much going all the time. Right. Because we manage the city of Scottsdale's single largest asset, right. a lot of my work is interacting with the city, working with city staff, with our elected officials, right, right. and making sure that we're moving the preserve in the right direction, sure. making sure that we're partnering adequately, and we've got a great team of folks. Mm -hmm. uh, there are five people on city staff that are dedicated to the preserve, and we've got our team, which is about 10 people okay. this summer. And then we've got 700 volunteer stewards yes. that are out there doing all the hard work. Right. And you were telling us a little bit ago, so the stewards actually go through an elevated type of training, 20, 20 some hours, they get to become a steward, but Absolutely. you're adding in where there's going to be volunteers opportunities that aren't quite going in, is that right? Correct. So okay. our stewards right now, if you wanted to become a steward, we ask you to attend our new steward orientation, which is about a six hour training that we have right here at the gateway. Sure. And then following that, we've got about 20 hours of supplemental training where you work with a steward mentor to teach you through the different programs and different areas of interest you're in. And that's what we have about 700 folks to do. And recently we've gotten a lot of interest from other folks that said, I want to be able to help, but I, I just don't have the time to volunteer every week, every month, right, all right. the way around the year. So this summer we're actually going to be launching a new volunteer program that is a little bit different. Our current one's the steward program, and this one's going to be volunteers, where people can come out, and whether that's helping us with our large events like the Arizona Children's and Learning Play Festival, or sure. our Junior Citizen Science Festival, our corporate service days, come out for meetup days, yeah, yeah, absolutely. things like that where people can just come out and help every now and then. Sure. We're fortunate of our 700 folks, our bulk of them are retired because a lot of our work that the stewards do is Monday through Friday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they're actually on the trail, right? So they're out absolutely. walking around making sure everybody's safe, making sure everything's good. Um, and cleaning up trails to keep the trails in line. Is that oh, yeah. Our, lar line? our largest program is our patrol program. Okay. So we've got about 350 stewards in that. And they're out walking the 250 miles of trails that we have. Sure. Making sure that there's no safety hazards. Making sure that people aren't in distress. People have enough water. People sure. know where they're yeah, going. We have, we have a fun little joke when I talk to people coming to the preserve that uh, they'll ask me for a map and I'll give them a map and I'll say the one biggest thing you need to remember about the map is it's very handy as long as you know where you are. Yeah. <laughs> if you open it up once you don't know where you are, right. yeah, then it's we're not gonna, gonna do, It's not gonna do a lot for you, right? But yeah, then the rest of our folks are out doing construction and maintenance. So right. when we have the storms and the trails wash out, or rocks wash down, they're sure. clearing those off. When we have cactuses fall over, unfortunately it happened right after our big rainy season. A sure. lot of our saguaros got so, oh, yeah, got so, big, so huh? big, they unfortunately fell over. Right. Right. So and that's it. That's the end of the day right there, right? For them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. So we push it off trail. The cool part is it becomes a habitat. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody moves into it. Right. And all of our fun wildlife out here, there's some, an opportunity for someone to find trouble. Sure. Speaking of the wildlife, we had just talked earlier about snakes. And what are some, what are some of the things that we, uh, the people out there should know about when they get to watch for snakes or hike, especially this time of year? Absolutely. We tell people always stay on trail. And people say, well, why? And it's because we've got so many rocks and everything around here. It is our critter's home. We're just visitors. Right. Here's a chance you could step over a rock and maybe send a little to a rattlesnake or yeah. a couple other critters. It's that not something you want to say hello to. <laughs> yeah, that's not, trust me. Yeah, that's not a good interaction. <laughs> and the fun part is a lot of people say, well, the, is that snake going to chase me? Is that going to? No. They're not going to chase you because right. they don't want you around just as much as you don't want them around. Where you have problem encounters with snakes, sometimes if, if people startle one. Right. Or if one is, right now is the perfect example, if they're out sunbathing, sure. they're stretched out and they don't hear you come up on them. Well, they're out taking a nap, right? So exactly. if, you're, if you're at home taking a nap in the backyard, somebody's stomping up on you, probably not going to be really You'd be happy. scared of too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. yeah, I mean, we've got the snakes, we've got all of our different wildlife out here that we don't want people to engage with. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, so, you know, it, it opens at dawn and it closes at dusk, right? Correct. And you were telling us earlier, 
reasoning behind that, but can you kind of expound upon that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are familiar with nocturnal animals, right. so like owls and a lot of our ones that come out at night, and then we've got our, our diurnal animals, our daytime ones, like our lizards and our snakes. But what a lot of people don't realize is over 60% of the wildlife we have here in the preserve uh -huh. is what's called crepuscular. I know, fun science yeah. term. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> which means they come out at dusk and dawn. Right. So the bulk of their That's activity... their hunting time or their feeding time or whatever, right? So we want to go ahead and let them have that. Sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> We're visiting their house. Worst the time state. to run into them, sure. Right? Yeah. So you always hear constantly in the next door app and all that stuff, the mountain lion thing, mm -hmm. right? So they're here, right? Oh, they're here. Okay. Any kind of... Is there tracking that goes on with that, or do you guys have a, a biologist or anybody that kind of follows them? Or is well, there... Game and Fish, okay. we partner with them. Um, the Game Warden who oversees this area, we partner heavily with them, as well as we've got our citizen scientists volunteers and our, our professional staff, which is our scientists. Right. That we do a lot of wildlife monitoring, the mountain lions and the bobcats, we know they're out here, sure. not because particularly we're tracking them, mm -hmm. but we see what they leave behind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll come across a meal, right? perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> so we know they're out here. Yeah, that's amazing. So, and you were saying earlier, like when you go out here, like I've been out here a million times, um, haven't seen a mountain lion on this preserve yet, seen one farther north, but uh, but they see you, right? So they're, they're out there, there's oh, a yeah. higher chance that they're keeping track of you. Than well, you that's the fun part, especially as you get closer to the mountains, because yeah. that's where they're living up in the end. Really, the McDowell's and up north, because that's right. where a lot of our mule deer populations are. Right. And we t ask, people ask me all the time, what are the odds I'm going to see a mountain lion? Right. I say probably half a percent. Yeah, yeah. But the odds that they'll see you is probably about 40 to 50. Right, right. So they know, they're aware. And I did see some deer actually in here the other day. Mm -hmm. I mean, right right on Thompson Peak. I mean, I was in hiking, and they were maybe a quarter mile off the, off the road. That's the first time I've seen them in here, but they're here for sure. Right? Oh, yeah, the mule deer, um, one of the cool scientific research projects that we just concluded past year, and we're still compiling all these data, is we worked with Game and Fish to collar 36 of our mule deer oh, around cool. here, and we monitored their movements for two years, uh -huh. to try and see migratory patterns, see the wildlife sure. connectivity if they're going up to Tonto, if they're right, going right. over to the county park, and Game and Fish is uh, going through all that data, Okay. because the collars checked in, I think it was every 60 seconds. Oh, wow. Um, it was either every minute or three minutes, but if you can imagine 36 of those oh, yeah. for two years, that's a lot of yeah, data. Yeah, a ton. Um, so that's what they're working on. Yep. And some people ask the question, um, they'll, they'll hear rumors, they'll hear about hunting season in the preserve. Yeah. And that is a thing. Um, through our in this preserve right here? Correct. Okay, wow. Um, that. It is not every year, but mm -hmm. quite often there's about a month period that game and fish will allow bow hunting in the preserve. Mm -hmm. And it is only when the populations are overpopulated. Sure, so they're thinning the herd. Yeah, so yeah. they'll go out and do visual counts on javelina herds, mm -hmm. as well as mule deer populations. And if there is an opportunity for an overpopulation, mm -hmm. they will authorize hunting for a brief period of time. Sure. And that's because we want to make sure that the resources available in the preserve are adequate for our wildlife. Sure. We don't want to have an overpopulation and a lack of resources, mm -hmm. and then them not able to sustain themselves. So as, as a city, we're really lucky to have gotten you as an executive director here. Oh, um, I don't know about that. I, I think agree. so. I mean, <laughs> I'm looking, so your your background is, is uh, nonprofits and accounting background, but Special Olympics, Phoenix Pride. I think you're doing something with the, the state of Arizona now as well, like a, a board or commission, or maybe that's the city of Phoenix. Well, no, there's a few, so okay. I, I have a hard time saying no. Okay. When I yeah. stick them back. <laughs> um, my mother jokes that she got me into volunteering when I was three. Uh -huh. Um, she was a volunteer was for special. She, got to go. yeah. <laughs> she was a volunteer for Special Olympics, uh -huh. and she brought me out of my car seat, mm -hmm. and I used to watch her do the work, and I, I had the bug bitten from that. Oh wow! Love so it. when I was a teenager, we lived in Colorado, right? And I was a ski instructor for people with disabilities. Oh wow, that's cool. So yeah. volunteer. Um, right. It was for Special Olympics, and I taught amputees and blind skiers how to ski. Oh wow! So it's amazing. Is that a good combination? I mean, well, then not together. Okay. <laughs> Independent <laughs> of each other. But um, I loved it so much because, especially with my blind students, they put so much faith in me. Sure. Because yeah, they, they're going down a mountain right. on a set of skis, yeah. and they can't see me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's crazy. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. So then I just I volunteered for Special Olympics uh -huh. all throughout uh, my teenage years, my college years, up until not even that long ago. Uh, I came on board with Phoenix Pride mm -hmm. about seven years ago. Okay. And that was my first nonprofit gig full time. Right. Right. And then over to the Conservancy because I get to marry my passion with my profession. Sure. And the cool part of what I love that I get to bring is because I have a corporate background. Right. A lot of my knowledge is in the business world. Sure. 
So I started my career with Disney in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and went through yes, the corporate yes, piece. Yes. Yeah. And it really helped me, and it's what's helped me with this organization and my sure. previous organization, was really elevating to that next level. Yeah, and I've heard many times that so Disney is a training ground for nations, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're, they're dialed in. I can't, can't doubt the box. Oh, yeah, that's true. Doing, right? they, they, yeah. they've, they've proven they know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you get to take that knowledge and bring it to the, to the nonprofit and make it work even better. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I tell my board, I tell my staff, I tell all our donors and volunteers. It's like, you have me in place to, to run the business. Right. And one of the things that I always remind people is, at the end of the day, we're two things. Mm -hmm. We're a nonprofit and a business. Sure. And we can be a business without being a nonprofit. Right. But we can't be a nonprofit without being a business. Absolutely. And that happens a lot of nonprofits. Mm -hmm. at the same time, so. Well, and as we've grown, a lot of folks don't realize the conservancy predates the preserve. Right. Um, the conservancy is the, the organization that led the initiative for the city to preserve mm -hmm. our McDowell's. Right. And one of the things that we've grown over the last 28 years of being a stewardship and advocacy organization, really being advocates for getting the land and getting people out in it and also being the stewards of it and sure. taking care of it. Yeah. And as we've grown, um, since I've come on board, we've launched two new initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, our, our biggest one is our youth education program. Mm -hmm. So we it sounds are, amazing, by the way. It's oh, really it's a cool. blast. We are teaching third and fourth grade elementary school students mm -hmm. about tunnels. Right. And yeah. a lot of them that we're targeting right now in this program are from Title I schools. Sure. So inner city communities. Yes. They've never been to the desert. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like in our surveys, it was so exciting to be able to show these, these fun and amazing concepts. We had 75% of the participants have never been to the desert. Wow. Because they're down in the asphalt jungle. Right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's like, it's like they see it from a distance, you know? That's, that's, that's where my wife time. teaches. Yeah. Yeah. School, so. yeah. And it was awesome because 90% of them said they were substantially more interested in learning about that. Sure. And one of the cool ones I loved was 100% of the teachers said that they were going to incorporate more outdoor activities. Oh, I love it. That's great. Yeah. And it's and it's so awesome to me. It gives me goosebumps because these kids don't have the opportunity to be exposed to stuff. Sure. And it's like there was a recent study that came out about a year and a half ago that the average youth in the valley spent seven and a half hours a day on an electronic device. Yeah. And a half hour outside. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So Which is a bummer, right? Yeah. So yeah. we can get them interested at this young age. Sure. Then it's amazing. And then the science side of what we're doing, we've really grown our research into invasive non-native plant species. Right. A right. lot of people don't realize fountain grass, buffalo grass, those are non-native. They're not from here. Oh, wow. Yeah. And what they do is they are the primary fuel load for water. Sure. Yeah. You see it in California. Oh, all the time. What just Not happened? Stop, right? yeah. Yeah. And it's what we're doing is doing a deep dive into that stuff. Sure. And saying, how can we eradicate and make this not a problem. Right, yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of folks see that impact it's having here and they think, what's the impact in Scottsdale? What I've tasked my team with is do the research so we can help our partners in California. Sure. So absolutely. we can help our partners in Mexico. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks don't realize about 40% of the world is arid or semi-arid. I know, we were talking about that earlier. It's, yeah. it's mind blowing. And it's, it's becoming more, right? Climate change is with, every day. Yeah, with, with climate change, yeah, yeah. it's becoming more and more. And a lot of folks don't realize that arid environments around the world are the least studied and researched environments. Sure. There are. And a lot of folks say, well, what, how's that impact me? Right. And because of population growth, mm -hmm. the desert's newest species is the human species. Yeah. It's estimated by 2030 about 50% of the human population will live in an arid environment. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Right? Um, it's just crazy. So what are we doing here? How can that impact our friends that are major in our nation? Or even a great example is there a species of buffalo grass that's here mm -hmm. that is having a major problem in Australia. Oh, sure. And sure. lightning strikes. Fires, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lightning yeah. strikes are causing these wildfires that are decimating villages. Sure. They don't have fire departments. They don't right. have the opportunity to find it. So I task my team and all of our folks that involved with what are we doing at Scottsdale and how can that help change the world? Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So I guess right now the city council or the city is also looking at some funds that they have available to possibly uh, increase the preserve, right, mm -hmm. to, to buy some more property. And are you involved in that on a regular basis, or is that kind of off your wheel now? Well, that's the fun part. I meet with our elected officials and city staff probably at least once a week. Mm -hmm. So because we are tasked by the city for managing its largest asset, sure. working with the city in partnership is, I could probably even safely say, a daily thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So, with the council this last week deciding to take a look and seeing if there's opportunities for more expansion, if there's opportunities to grow the preserve with what's left, which sure. is awesome. And we're excited to partner with them on seeing if that's a possibility. Right. 
and see where we go from here. Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time. And one more time, if you want to volunteer mm -hmm. or just get some great information about it, go to the web, and the web address is? Yeah, if you go to mcdowellsonoran.org, there's information on volunteering, information on the preserve, our organization. If you want to donate, there's opportunities sure. there as well to support the great and work we'll we're doing. And we'll throw that in there. So at every trailhead, not every trailhead yet, soon. but coming soon, there's a donation box. So, you know, just slip a couple bucks in there. Everything helps. Yeah, so. every little bit helps. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Justin. I really awesome. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.